Uh, let me just quickly pray. Father, we, uh, again, Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the time that we have had. And Lord, now as we uh, just open up your word and we have a bit of a look at some of the stuff uh, in these ancient documents, God, we just pray, would you open our eyes to see the things you want us to see, open our ears to hear the things you want us to hear. Speak to us, change us, transform us more and more into the image of your son, Jesus. We ask it in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Uh, we've been, we, we started talking a couple of weeks ago about uh, different things. We've been, been on a bit of a theme of the Holy Spirit for a while now. And a few weeks ago, uh, I spoke about uh, grieving the Holy Spirit. And we spent a bit of time talking about uh, what grieving the Holy Spirit looks like, what it means, uh, what Paul was talking about when he wrote that, that, that passage there in the book, uh, in the letter to the Ephesian churches. Um, I want to move on to another aspect of uh, three, or talk, start talking about three things we don't want to do to the Holy Spirit and with the Holy Spirit. I want to move on this morning to uh, the next one, which is quenching the Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19, Paul writes to this uh, Thessalonian church this statement. He says, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit. We're told do not grieve the Spirit. And here to this group of uh, Thessalonian believers, he writes this statement, do not quench the spirit. Now, I want to just say up front, because we're kind of limited with time, quenching the spirit can be done in many and various and different ways. So I'm probably going to take a couple of weeks to sort of unpack this one and talk a bit more about it. We're going to start in one space and we'll move on. But I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had a moment or a season in your life where you found yourself with a deep hunger and a deep passion for the things of God. Anyone ever go through that season of life where you just there's just something inside of you that is crying out for God? You just can't wait to get into His Word. You feel like you're discovering new gems. You you want to pray. Prayer is not a burden. It's not something that you're being told you have to be at because it's a meeting or it's something that you want to do. It's like there's something going on in the inside of you that's drawing you towards uh, the Word of God. It's drawing you towards prayer. It's drawing you towards fellowship. You wake up Sunday morning, the waves are perfect, the sky is blue, the fish are jumping, and you love fishing and surfing, but you look at that, but there's something in you going, I don't care, I have to go and spend time with my brothers and my sisters in the Lord. I just need to worship God. I just want to worship God. I'm in the car and I've got my worship music playing and so on. Anyone ever have a season or a period in their life where they felt that kind of drawing towards God and hunger and passion for the Lord? I've I've had those seasons in my life. Uh, David put it this way in Psalm 42 verse 1. He, he said, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. In fact, I don't think it was, it was necessarily David that wrote that psalm. They're not sure. But the writer of that psalm says, As a deer pants for the water brook, so my soul longs after you. There are seasons in life, and, and when I read that out, there will be some people sitting here, and maybe you're in a place right now where you're looking at that going, that's just overly emotional. That's just excessive. That's just, you know, when people say, oh, I surrender all, and really they mean I surrender a tenth. But you don't want to say I surrender a tenth. It ain't sexy. It's not spiritual. No one's going to think you're great. So you just say, I surrender all, you know. But really, eh, do you? Well, he's not just writing this because he's sitting there going, I'd just love to write some really emotional... No, this, is, this is his soul crying out, just penning his thoughts, uh, writing down how he's feeling in the moment. And he's saying, as a deer pants for water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. I have had those seasons in my life. And from the sound of the question I just asked you, so have you, those seasons where your soul just pants for God. You just want... God, there's there's a longing and a desire for his word, his presence, for worship, for his people. Uh, That that, that side of life just becomes so real and so you're drawn to those things. When I was 20, I met a young man and his name was Justin Colwell. His wife was here uh, a few weeks ago in in a service with us. And uh, when we were 20, we crossed paths in an organisation called Youth with a Mission. And for whatever reason... God was doing something in my heart and Justin's heart and we kind of came together and this was at a time on the YWAM base where there was, we were seeing lots of stuff going on, there were healings and it was a very unique period of time on a YWAM training school base. We didn't have a lecture room, we were in a tent, uh, Marie was there and the Holy Spirit is moving 
and uh, we're seeing healings and deliverances and so on. But me and Justin, we developed this strong friendship and what we found and has lingered and remained with me more than all that external outward stuff was we discovered that we had this incredible passion and hunger to want to be in the presence of God. When people would finish lectures and go to bed and go to sleep, we would go and unlock the TV room because we knew where the key was hidden. So we would sneak out, unlock the TV room. We would go into the TV room and me and Justin would pray. We would take a Bible in there and we would pray. And it would would not be uncommon for us to be starting prayer at about 9.30, 10 o'clock at night and the sun is coming up as we're trying to go back to our dorm to see if we can squeeze an hour of sleep in because we know we've got to be up for lectures the next morning. And it wasn't a burden. It wasn't something we were trying to do to impress God. It almost felt like it was a season of life where I just feel like I have to do this. As a deer pants for water, there was something in me that was just going, God, I just have to know you more. God, I just need to be with you. I need to experience your presence. God, I need to get into your word. It's food for my spirit. Lord, I need to worship you, God. I need to be with people that are going to encourage that and feed that and fan that flame in my heart of passion for you. It was an amazing, amazing season of life. And I praise God. I honestly don't think if it wasn't for that period, that season of life and what God was doing inside of my heart, with all the turmoil and the rubbish and the junk that has come against me in the years since. I don't know whether I would still be running as strong for the Lord if I didn't have something take place in my heart during that season of life. I was sitting at home the other day and I'm sitting in the lounge room and Jackie were chatting and I was listening to you by the way, I was listening to every word, I can't remember what you said but I was listening to every word but I'm looking up in the top corner of the lounge room and there's a spider web just hanging there. And I'm watching this spider web, and as I'm looking at it, it's, it's, it's motion, motionless. The windows are closed, the doors are closed, it's just hanging there, you know? And I'm, I'm, I'm hearing everything, saying, and the spider web's there. And then all of a sudden, I'm watching this spider web just starts to, it just starts to gently sway. And I'm looking at this web, and it's just gently swaying, and I'm thinking, why is that, how is that spider web gently swaying? The doors are closed, and we didn't open them. The windows were closed, we didn't get up and open them. We weren't walking around or making any motion or any movement. But all of a sudden, this spider web just starts swaying back and forth. And here's what I felt like. I submit this to you. This is what I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me in that moment. I felt like he said to me, Alan, there's a gentle breeze of the Holy Spirit right now that's blowing around Arise. That's blowing on the lives of different people that, that come along to this place. There's this gentle breeze blowing. And it's not anything that we made happen. We didn't get up and open the window, open the door, turn on a fan. It just happened because it was the right time and the right season in God where God wanted to do something. And people's hearts were in a good space and we were in a right place. And this gentle breeze, this gentle wind of the Holy Spirit is beginning to blow. And I felt like God said to me, that's what's happening here at Arise. It's nothing for anyone here to get proud and arrogant about. We haven't done anything. We haven't uh, changed the way we do things. We're just trying to be faithful with what we're doing. You come along, you're being faithful in your life with what you do. But there's this gentle breeze of the Holy Spirit that's beginning to blow across the hearts and the lives of people in this place. So I speak to a number of people in this space and I know that there are some people here and you've expressed to me that you're, you're feeling that 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 desire for God again, that there's this thing happening on the inside where you're finding yourself getting hungry again. I, I, I loved your communion message this morning because I'm sitting there listening and, I'm, and in my mind I'm seeing that cold gun. That's the, that's the Holy Spirit. That's, that's the work of the Spirit in a person's life. That's the Holy Spirit moving and doing what he does. I know the Spirit is moving in this place primarily because I know that there are people here who are having that fan, that flame fanned up again, and you're finding within your heart a passion and a desire for God again. How many of you feel like there's just something going on on the inside of you? You're, you're feeling like you're, you're, just, you're, you're wanting to press into God a bit more. You're wanting to take maybe his word a bit more serious. You're, wanting to, to, you're desiring his presence a bit more. You're entering into it. Who in this place feels like there's something going on inside your heart, in your life? Everybody else might not see it, but you know inside. Hands up. There's something going on. Now, can you put your hand straight up? I want you to look around. I want people to look around. I'm, I'm trying to make a point here. I want you to look around the room. I want you to know this, that is the biblical evidence of a work of the Holy Spirit. That is the biblical evidence 
of a move, call it whatever you want. That is the biblical evidence that the Holy Spirit is moving in a direction in this place in your lives. Now, let me, let me tell you how I know that. Number one, because your flesh is not pushing you towards God. Your flesh does not want to kill itself. There's nothing in the fleshly nature of you that's going to go, hey, let's get more hungry for Jesus. Let's not, let's not eat today. Let's fast this meal and seek his face. Let's not go surfing. Let's go to church. Let's not watch that TV show. Let's pick up our Bible and, and, and get into these ancient documents and have a look and see what God is saying. Let's not listen to music in the car. Let's just pray while we're driving somewhere or sit quietly and look at the world around and, and see if we can, can't sense what God might be saying to us. Galatians chapter 5 Verse 16 and 17, Paul writes this to the Galatian churches. He says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. And verse 17 is coming up there. For the flesh, watch this, the flesh, what? It's what? It's contrary to the Spirit. It's like the flesh is contrary to the Spirit. The flesh and the Spirit are not sitting in the same vehicle, going in the same direction. They're both pulled up next to you going, No, pick me, no, pick me, pick me, pick me, no, pick me. And we make the decision which one we pick. He says that, the, that, that, that what, the, what the, the flesh desires is contrary to what the spirit desires. And the spirit desires stuff that's contrary to the flesh. So we know that these two things are in opposition. So if you're getting hungry for God and you're desiring the presence of God and there's something in your heart that's drawing you towards God, number one, we know that is not a work of the flesh because that is not how the flesh operates. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. There's a conflict going on. But if you're feeling within yourself this fresh desire and fresh fire and passion for God, His Word, His presence, His people, for worship, and you're feeling that inside of you, that is an evidence, that is a biblical evidence of a work of the Holy Spirit taking place in your life and taking place in this community. The second reason why I know that is because the Holy Spirit is the one that pushes you towards God. In John 16, 14, Jesus said this about the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, he said, He, meaning the Holy Spirit, He will what? He will glorify me. He is going to take of what is mine and he's going to give that to you. He's going to reveal me to you. He's going to be constantly getting your attention. One thing I love about Daniel, I'll brag on Daniel for a little bit. Daniel stands up here and he plays worship, right? Ding, 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 does his worship thing, right? Here's what I love about Daniel. I never feel like Daniel's up here playing saying, look at me. I'm looking at Daniel because he's up here leading. But every time, Daniel, you're up here leading, I see a guy that's got his hands on a fretboard and hands on fingers. But in the spirit, I see a guy going, look at him. Look at him. And he points us to something other than himself. And that's what Jesus said. When the spirit comes, he's going to point you to me. He's going to make sure that he's bringing glory to me and that he's pushing you towards the person of Jesus. So I know two things, that your flesh is not pushing you towards God. And I know that the Holy Spirit does. So I'm very, very confident to say in this place now that there is this, like that spider web, there's this gentle breeze, this gentle blowing of the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you look at, 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 in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you go and have a look at what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. And here's what you will find. Most of, if not all of what Jesus said the Spirit will do when he comes was all stuff that would take place internally inside the believer not externally, not externally. I think we've been duped into thinking and wanting. I know people that if, if, if somebody doesn't fall over in a prayer line, the Holy Spirit's not there. If that's what you're looking for, you are going to be a frustrated believer who will be out of sync with the Holy Spirit for your whole life. If we didn't see a healing, then the Holy Spirit wasn't there. The, the temptation when the Holy Spirit begins to move is that, and this is what's happened. If you go and look at the history of revival, here's what happens. God begins to move in spite of us. In spite of us. It's not like somebody said, let's sit down, get a calendar together as a church, leadership. We're going to have a meeting. What can we do? Let's start preaching on this. Then we're going to do that. By this week, we're going to start praying for people. If they don't fall, just give them a gentle nudge. It'll look really, really good. It'll get people's faith levels up. And then by about this date, let's plan on that date, the Holy Spirit's going to fall. We're going to have a revival. Nobody ever did that. The Spirit of God just decided that he was going to move, he was going to fall on good soil, on good hearts, people that were positioned, uh, focused on Jesus, hungry for God, passionate for God. It's like the work of the Spirit has to happen in us before it's ever going to happen through us. 
We have to embrace what the Holy Spirit does in our lives if we ever want to be the kinds of people that the Holy Spirit will do things through our lives. And many people, what we do is we quench and we squash the work of the Holy Spirit inside our lives. Inside of our lives. See, many people only give the Holy Spirit attention when he puts on a public performance. But then we get up and we ignore his personal presence in our lives for the rest of the week. We don't listen to the things that he might be wanting to do in our hearts, the things he might be wanting to say to us, the ways he might be wanting to lead us. Oh, yeah, look, I'm happy. God, if you lead me to to go and tell someone about Jesus and pray for sick, I'll do that. But what? You're telling me to repent of something? What? You're telling me to stop doing that and line myself up more with you? That's why I loved you. I absolutely loved your communion message this morning. I could have, I could have got up if we weren't doing I would have got up and just prayed and said, Amen, that's, that's the word for today. That's the word for today. And here's a man that the Holy Spirit is doing something, and what does he do? Responds. Responds. Goes with what it is that the Holy Spirit is saying. Many of us, we ignore the Spirit. We, don't, we, we, we quench the Spirit in our own personal life, but then we want to come to a meeting and we want the Holy Spirit to run right and do all kinds of crazy ones. Hey, let me put my hand up first and say, oh, I'm the first one here to say, I want to see healings on a Sunday morning. I want to see deliverances on a Sunday morning. I want to see people set free. I want to see people coming to faith. I want to see people running up the front. Uh, you know, in Acts chapter 2, Peter gives this great sermon and he didn't say to them, now bow your heads, who wants to come to faith? It actually says that the, well, while he's preaching, the crowd said, what must we do to be saved? They were that hungry and that moved upon by the Holy Spirit that that, that happened. I, I long for those days. I want those days. So, so I'm not saying I don't, I believe, I want to see all that. That's why I'm saying and encouraging us, if we ever want to be that kind of community, we want to see God do that sort of stuff through us, we have to not quench the spirit of God inside of us when he's trying to do things in us. Because he wants to do a work in us first. That's the primary thing. If he can do that work in us, then he can do a work through us. When we think about quenching the spirit, most of the time we think about a public performance. Somebody gets up, oh, they've quenched the spirit in a public place. Ever been in those sorts of places? And, and you feel like the Spirit's doing something and a leader or somebody gets up and you feel like, oh, they've shut it down and we all go away and we chew out the leader or we chew out the movement or we chew out the Spirit. You know, oh, they stop the Spirit and so on. Here's one thing I'm pretty aware of. I think if God wants to do something, he can pretty much do what he wants to do when he wants to do because he wants to do it. And if he really wants to do something bad enough, no one's going to stop it. No one's going to stop it. That's the way God works. So how do we quench the Spirit? Um... We were in India one time, and I remember going to this village in India. These people, it was, a, it was a, a, a religious village of another religion, very much a stronghold. We went in there just to do a little meeting one day in a uh, little mud hut with about four or five people. We went in there, we did the meeting, and the Holy Spirit began to move in the hearts of these people. So they asked us, will you come back again tomorrow? We're only meant to be there for a day or two. We came back the next day. The next day, the hut was full. All the neighbors heard... Something was happening there. There was some sort of spiritual thing going on. So they came along. They heard the gospel message and we began to see. We saw some healings and so on like that. But more than that, we saw people getting hungry for the person of Jesus Christ. We came back the next day. Cut a long story short, we did about 11 days straight there. By the end of it, we were in the main square, in the main street, in the middle of the village. We've got their sacred tree that they worship over there, this tree that they bowed to and prayed to. We're standing right near the tree and we are preaching Jesus Christ. And we're seeing all kinds of amazing, wonderful things happen. Signs, wonders, miracles, and so on. But here's the thing. On the 12th day, the leaders of the village got wind of everything that was going on and they were seeing how people were turning to faith in Christ. So they went door to door and said to everybody in that village, if you go to the meeting, Tomorrow night, here's what we will do. We will take away your burial plot because they all had a burial plot given to them. When they died, they were going to be buried. We'll take that away. We will remove your children from the school. We will sack you from your employment and so on if you keep going to these meetings. We came back the next day and, of course, nobody came out and and, uh, everything kind of stopped. But here's the thing. You can stop that kind of public stuff going on if you want to. What you can't stop is the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's heart. Amen. Sometimes we get so focused on what's going on in the public space and, oh, that's quenching. That's a, let me tell you something. If the Holy Spirit is doing something in you and you keep your heart right before God, no man, woman or child is going to... They can squash whatever they want in a public space. God is not necessarily wanting to do all the public stuff. His primary thing is in the space of the heart. It's the work of the heart that God wants to. I want to give you a biblical uh, picture of that. Uh, in Acts chapter 17, verse 2, Paul goes to uh, 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 the town of Thessalonica, right? Thessalonica, which is where he writes this passage to this same group of people where he says, do not quench the Spirit. 
He goes in there in Acts 17 too, it says this. Oh, what am I looking at? Oh, it's not Acts 17 too. What did I give you up there? 1 8. I will skip that because I'm running out of time. Running out of time. Anyway, the beginning of, of the Thessalonian letter, here's what Paul writes. I think it's 1 7. Thessalonians 1 7. 1 Thessalonians 1 7, somewhere there. Paul writes this to them. He says, You guys have such great, amazing faith that I don't even have to talk about your faith to people. They all know about it. The regions and the cities around, they know about this incredible, amazing faith that's existent in the people in the Thessalonican church, right? I think it's 1 Thessalonians 1 7, somewhere there. The, the, the faith of these people was so strong and so evident to the communities around that Paul said, We, don't, we go somewhere, we say we've been to Thessalonica, we don't need to say nothing more than that. They go, Dude, these guys have real solid faith. Real solid faith. 1 Thessalonians, there it is, 1, 7 to 8. You became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia. From you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so we do not need to say anything. Their faith was so incredibly strong. But the interesting thing is that, biblically, Paul only spent three weeks in that community. And guess what happened at the end of the three weeks? They grabbed Jason, they beat him up, and they run Paul out of town. Nighttime, they, they opened a gate and they snuck him out of town so he wouldn't get beat up. Paul spent three weeks, three weeks in this place, and all it tells us in the book of Acts is that he spent three Sabbaths reasoning in the synagogue. That's what it says. Three weeks. He spent in there and he was preaching, and then he gets run out of town. I can imagine a lot of people going, oh, they've just quenched the spirit. God was doing something. Yet here we are not much longer later, and Paul's going, your faith, whatever's gone on in that space, whatever happened in your hearts during those three weeks, no man could quench that. And now we have a really, really strong church growing because the Holy Spirit wants to primarily work in our hearts. He wants to do stuff in us. Uh, we love the outward stuff, and I love the outward stuff, and I want the outward stuff. But if we live for the outward stuff, what we end up doing is we're so focused on that, we can neglect the very work of the Holy Spirit inside of our own hearts. That's the first port of call for anything the Spirit wants to do. It's going to be inside your heart. We could have... We could have people falling over. We can have healings, miracles, signs and wonders going on in this church this morning. Every one of you could get healed of a physical ailment, an emotional ailment. We could, we could rock and roll with the best of the spiritual giants. I've been in meetings with all kinds of weird and wonderful things happening. I've seen people picked up and thrown three rows of chairs backwards and landing on the ground. I've seen all kinds of weird and wonderful manifestations. And, and look, most of them were God. I have no problem with it. I, and, and it's exciting. And I love being in those spaces. But I've also seen many, many people in those spaces that when the excitement of all that goes down and the emotion disappears they're off God they don't like God they're actually not that hungry they're not that passionate about the Lord they're not going to build their house on the rock they're going to build it on the sand do whatever they want anyway the fun's over so we're going to move on we're here to build and the Holy Spirit is here to build strong Christian lives so we can have all that stuff happen here this morning you know what's going to happen we're all going to see it. The people who are already in the house, in the family are going to get to see a performance and a display and all the fun and wonderful go yeah 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 but if the Holy Spirit primarily wants to work on the inside of you and he wants to change you and he wants to conform you into a public, the public image of Jesus Christ, then you get up from this place and you go to work tomorrow or you go to school tomorrow or you go to university tomorrow or you go wherever it is that you're going to go tomorrow to the shopping mall or wherever it is that you end up going. Then you take that work of the Holy Spirit that's transforming you into the image of Christ, you take that work out there into the public space where Jesus wants to be glorified. Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And what's the result of the power? You shall be what? Witnesses. Witnesses. You shall be a witness. Your life shall become a witness because of the power of the Spirit and what the Spirit is doing inside of your life. Again, I want to, I pray for the day. I come in here this morning, I prayed on every single chair, laid hands on every chair in this auditorium and prayed, Holy Spirit, do something amazing, wonderful. I don't care whether you come up, sit there, get healed in your chair. It doesn't bother me, it would be wonderful. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, if we do not cooperate with the Spirit and His work in our hearts, if we quench the move of the Holy Spirit in our own personal lives, then what's the point? What's the point? 
When we think about quenching the Spirit, sometimes we are so outward focused and I think we need to stop and have a look because God is doing something right now. And what tends to happen in the history of revival when God starts doing something, the first thing that men do is once it starts to become a really popular big show, whatever, what do we want to do? We want to control it. We fall into the two temptations. One, we try to make God do something that he's not doing. Let's get all emotional. I'll get you all up here, start pushing you over. I I, I was in a meeting once and a guy wanted everyone to speak in tongues and we all came up the front and he just said, repeat after me, Abba. So we went Abba. He said, say Dabba. We went Dabba. He said, now say Abba Dabba. We all went Abba Dabba. He said, say it again. We went Abba Dabba. He said, put it together really fast. Abba Dabba, Abba Dabba, Abba Dabba. And we're all standing there, grown men, grown women who love God, about 30 of us standing up the front going, Abba Dabba, Abba Dabba, Abba. He's jumping around going, yes, it's the spirit. And I'm thinking, no, it's not. I'm just saying Abba Dabba. But it didn't really matter. It just looked the part and everyone was excited because people were saying abba And I talked to people ever since then from there and we're all going, what were we doing? That was so dumb. But in the moment, we got all caught up. God, oh, that was a spirit. That wasn't. It was just some clown saying, say abba And then he felt really good and went and wrote in his newsletter, the whole place was filled with the spirit. No, it wasn't. We were filled with two words, abba Totally different. We can move into the extreme of trying to make God do something he's not doing. The other extreme is that we stop God from doing what it is that he is doing. And let me tell you something. When the Holy Spirit begins to blow, man is a poor manager of the Spirit. We are a poor manager of any type of movement of the Holy Spirit. And and, and this is on my heart today because I genuinely do believe right now that there is this gentle breeze of the Holy Spirit that's blowing here. And I don't believe it's because we have done anything great. We haven't cracked the code. We haven't done... I believe for whatever reason God has just chosen that he's going to blow his spirit across people's hearts. And here's the challenge for each of us as individuals. Are you going to go with the Holy Spirit and what he's doing on on the inside of you? Are you going to respond to him? Or are you going to quench the Holy Spirit in your own personal world what are you going to do we quench the spirit in our own personal lives by not responding to the work of the spirit within us first we ignore the holy spirit's call to personal repentance if the holy spirit's knocking on your door calling you to repent of something repent get it right we ignore his call to humble ourselves i'm not going to do that people will think people might think i'm let me tell you something right now publicly when I hear someone like Brendan get up this morning and talk about, my, my view of you has always been high. We went to school together. We didn't sort of have a lot to do with each other, but, but we, we, we went to school together. My view of you goes through the roof because that's a man of God. Amen. That is a man of God. Yeah. When we ignore his call to walk in accountability, we quench the spirit in our own life. We think we can do it all ourselves. I'll be the first one to tell you, I've got people uh, around, all around the world that I'm accountable in different areas that I speak to. I've got people in this local community that I'm accountable to in areas of my life because I know that that's the right way to walk and that's something I feel the Holy Spirit has said to me, so I've got to have accountability. And so I do that and I open myself up to that. When we ignore his call to receive prayer, you know sometimes God's saying to you, hey, you, you, go and get someone to pray with you about this, but you sit there and you go, no, it's all fine, I can handle it. I mean, God, you can hear me when I'm by myself, it doesn't really matter. I wonder some Sundays, I look out here and some Sundays I wonder when there's a call to prayer, how many people sit there and you go, oh, look, I'd love to get up there, but oh, no, what would people think of me if I go up for prayer? So I'll just, but the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter what you think, what I think, what might happen, might not happen. What happens is in that moment, the Spirit's leading you and we go, no. And that's what quenching the Spirit in our own life is. When we quench the Spirit, we fail to allow ourselves to be led by the Holy Spirit in that moment. We choose to be led by something else. We ignore his call to be a blessing to somebody else. We ignore his call to be generous with our words, with our gifts, with our time, with our talents, with our finance. We ignore his call to be spiritually disciplined. He's wooing us. Come, spend some time with me. Come on, come on, pick it up, dust it off. Open the pages. You might not understand everything, but get it in you. Come on, get along to church or your connect group or whatever it is that you go and Get with a bunch of people, get hungry, press in to the Lord. And any other number of things that the Holy Spirit might be saying to us. That word quench literally means to extinguish. Literally means to extinguish. And I was hoping today to have a big candle here. And what I wanted to do was just for dramatic effect, just every time you fail to allow yourself to be led as he conforms us to the image of Christ, we just, we extinguish that candle and we don't want to be people that extinguish that candle amen 
If you get a community of people who are passionate for God in their lives, not just on Sunday, and not just when other people are looking, then there's no limit to what God can do through that community of people. I'm going to get the... uh, I might just get Nick. Is Nick here? Nick's here? Where's Nick? Do you mind? Just jump up on the guitar for me. Just finish up. Is that all right? I'm going to get Nick up and uh, look, it's, it's 11.30, we had uh, announcements this morning, so we obviously went a little bit longer than we would normally would go, I hope that's okay. Uh, for those of you that are visiting, we normally finish a little bit early, but it's been a big, big Sunday for us this morning. Here's what I'm going to do, I'm going to just ask Nick just to play, just play some worship for us. And I just want to open up the front, and I felt like God said this morning, pray for those people that are feeling that stirring in their hearts. You're feeling that, that passion for God. There's that spark that has been flicked. And, and we want to pray for you this morning that God would fan into flame that spark, that it would continue to pick up momentum in your life because God is doing something in this place at the moment. Again, I don't say that as a proud and arrogant statement. It's my observation that when people start saying, I'm feeling hungry for God, that is not something that the flesh is encouraging. It's not something the devil is encouraging. It is the very thing that the Holy Spirit does in the lives of his people. Amen? So I just want to pray. And then once we've prayed, I just want you, if that's you this morning, I just want you to come on up. And uh, look, leaders, come and and pray. Pete and Cheryl, come and pray. Uh, We just want to stand with you and and pray for you. If you really, really, really are finding it hard and you can't get up and come up the front, then would you grab somebody that you know? Don't leave this place this morning. I, I really feel strongly that God wants to fan something in people's hearts today in terms of their passion towards him. So Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for who you are. God, we thank you for this, Lord, again, just this gentle breeze of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I I believe with all my heart, and I know there are people here this morning. I know that you, you, when when I talk about that gentle breeze, you know. You know that it's blowing on you. You feel it. You sense it. And Lord, what sort of speed that breeze picks up to, I don't know. Whether it stays like this, it dissipates, whether it turns into a raging windstorm, I don't know. And it doesn't matter. That's for you to decide, Lord. But God, I pray right now, each person in this room that is feeling that drawing, that calling, that leading back to intimacy, back to passion, God, back to the word, back to prayer, back to worship. Lord, I pray right now, Father, just move upon their hearts, God. Move upon their hearts, Lord. And God, I pray right now, Lord, as we, as, as, as we come forward and as we pray, Holy Spirit, would you just minister to those people, Lord. Minister to them, Father. We ask it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We're going to worship now. If you need to leave, I completely respect that. Uh, if you want to make a tea or coffee up the back, please just respect the space up the front while people are being prayed for. If you need to go, that's fine. If you want to stay, that's completely fine. Uh, it's been you know, a good morning. Uh, if we don't see you uh, between now and next week, have a great week. But we're just going to hang in this space for a little bit. Amen. Bless you. 